to mind. We're going to spend a little portion of meditating there. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping and praying that this will be a, a huge blessing um, and cur- encouragement for you um, today. Look, the context is verses 1 through 14, but I think you can hone in your, your gaze to verse 9 through to verse 12. And then the key verse of this chapter, which is verse 10. Do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength, which I'm sure many of you have seen or heard. Um, I'm hoping to unpack that and explain it in just a minute. So we are in the middle of a a new series. It's a mini-series that is lasting four weeks. And we've enjoyed two of those already. So today is week three. It's entitled, At Ease. And our prayer is that between longer series in our church, we can take a gap like this and allow Scripture just to be a blessing. And I've noticed just in counseling and in sharing and visiting with people, most of that's on the phone um, these days, um, I've noticed that people are feeling a little bit anxious, um, that the, the burdens of life generally are squeezing. Um, that's what the word in the Bible actually for, for trial is. It's the word pressure. And so people are experiencing that pressure, and it's my joy and my hope to allow these passages to speak for themselves into your circumstance and just wash over you and encourage you and be a blessing. So I've entitled today's message, Glad, the word glad, from these 14 verses. And I went to some dictionaries, as I've done through this series, to try and define the word contentment. And this is the definition I found this week. It is the state of being contented. That didn't take a rocket science to work that out. So contentment, believe it or not, is the state of being contented. So I looked further to find some better descriptive words than just to kind of uh, give us that simple definition. Like the word satisfied, it is the, the realm in which we live of being satisfied or an ease of mind And that really did hit the nail on the head for me in terms of what I desire and pray for when I think about this series and its impact on your lives and those listening elsewhere, that we would find the scriptures become a source of easing of our minds as we face various hardships in life. So I want to give credit to a few people like Mark McClellan, Kristen Johnson, Tony Reinker, and Matthew Henry. Uh, Praise the Lord for his um, outlining of the scriptures. Um, He's done some amazing work for us in the church in outlining the scriptures, and he had some insights that really were a blessing to me in preparing for today as well. So, if I had to frame this introduction and lay it out clearly for you, what what this sermon is actually is three advices that I want to give you. As your pastor, I'd like to give you three advices Um, From Nehemiah 8, they're not my personal opinions at all, but I want to use this passage to ease your mind. So can you follow along with me in those three advices? The first one is this, receive the word of God. Receive the word of God. For us to understand the context of Nehemiah, we need to understand firstly that Ezra and Nehemiah are one book in the original text. So it's good for us to study both together. Most preachers and commentators would approach the subject that way. And this is the storyline of the history spelled out in those two books. Israel has failed to keep God's law again. And I know we like to read about Israel and think, well, you know, Israel, can you not do better? But when we really think about it, this is an example given to us in Scripture of our human condition. And when you think about your track record with the Lord as well, and his expectation of perfection, his requirement of expectation, his sta- his, of perfection, his standard of perfection, then very quickly you realize that we are no different to the people of Israel. And again, find ourselves in a place of failure <clears throat> in keeping God's law, excuse me. As a consequence, God brings his judgment, which is just, and it comes in the form of destruction. So Jerusalem is destroyed, The Hebrew people are exiled to Babylon, and we read about this history in the Bible. And now, after that period of exile, there is need for rebuild. Godly Jeremiah hears news 
about the fact that the, the city has been destroyed, and he is in a position that he could do something about it. Most could not. Coming out of exile, having nothing, trying to repair a city and get life back on the track, um, almost impossible for other leaders. But for Nehemiah, he was in a position where he could do something about it. So he does, this is a study for another day. He prays first. It's very awesome the way that he approaches this new challenge. He prays first, seeks the Lord's help. God helps him, and they rebuild the city walls, and they erect the city gates again. But no different to the church of today, building the people of God was not about building bricks and mortar, steel and concrete and all that kind of thing. I had to learn this lesson many years ago when I started in my career in construction, hoping to use, as a believer, hoping to use that career for the Lord. I discovered over a period of a year how God bombarded me with scripture that the church is not made of bricks and mortar. We can build churches all over the place. We're still not building the church of the Lord in terms of buildings. The church of God is built by or made of people. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so this was the reality spiritually of the people of God as well. They needed to be built up spiritually. And so two reformers emerge, and the two reformers are Ezra and Nehemiah. And the reform, the otherwise known as revival, the getting right with God, started in a certain place. It started with Scripture. And that's where I'd like the sermon to begin as well. The people gathered. Ezra climbed a big pulpit, which was built so they could be heard and seen. And he began to read the law of God to the people. So there's this mass gathering. And then, of course, as he's reading the Pentateuch, which um, I, I, have tend to, I tend to believe was portions of the first five books of your Bible, so the, the law, the Torah, as he was reading that, there were others that were explaining it, and he was just continually reading the requirements of God to the people. There's a lovely image given in this text of this particular occasion. And I want you to notice a few details. The first detail is the place. So look to your Bible and you'll find the place was right before the water gate. So at first I thought, well, let's just move on. But I thought, no, hold on, how appropriate for the Word of God to be used here for revival at this particular place, right outside the water gate, which is a picture of refreshing. It's a picture of like washing of the Word, right? And I thought of Ephesians 5, how Ephesians 5 speaks about us being washed by the Word, and the place being the most appropriate place. Then secondly, notice the posture, the posture of the people. Tons of details are given. They stood in respect of the word. They said their amen, which was an affirmation of what scripture said. Basically what saying amen meant and means today is I agree. So I'm putting myself under God's law. I'm putting myself under God's judgment. So I'm prepared to make myself tiny under the judgments of God. I yield to it. I don't fight against it. That was the posture of the people. And it was shown in various bodily things like raising your hands, which is a picture of vulnerability, or bowing your head, that's humility. Worshiping, which is the appropriate response to, to God. It's saying God, what worship actually is, it comes from the etymology of worth. So God, you are most valuable to me. I, I ascribe worth to you is what worship is ultimately. And so folk were worshiping sincerely in their response, faces to the ground prostrate, and notice all of them were doing it. It wasn't just like pockets. But the masses were actually engaged in the posture of coming to God in this tiny position, saying, God, you are almighty, you are sovereign, you are the one who has the law, you are just, you are God, and we worship you. We make ourselves opposite to who you are. Then thirdly, I'd like you to notice the perception. So there's definitely the place, the posture, but there's also a perception. Follow with me in the text there, and you'll see in verse 2, there's understanding described, both men and women, who could understand what they heard. And then in verse 3, the same language is used again of men and women who, and the, who are part of those who could understand, and the ears of all people who were attentive to the book of the law. Then the same language in verse 7 again, and I'm showing you this repetition so that you'll see a theme that the author is trying to give us. As the people were helped to understand, the Levites turned up, and so while the preaching was going on in a mass kind of audience, I imagine the Levites running around forming pockets of people. We're talking about lots of people here. Forming pockets of people to, to meet in small groups. So it's like church and life group going on here. And as they were meeting in small groups, some of the questions would come and the Levites would then explain the law to people as they remained where they were. Verse 8 again, the, word, the law of the Lord was clearly presented in verse 8, so that 
the people understood. And then one more time in verse 12, this is the fifth reference to this theme in these verses, because they had understanding as the word was given to them. We don't know specifically who wrote Nehemiah, but the author of the book, nonetheless, goes to lengths to describe a particular response here, a detail that we need to see, and that is perception. So I ask myself, well, why did he do that? Under the inspiration of the Lord, why did he go through such great trouble to repeat this theme? And it dawned on me my first point for the sermon, and that is to receive the word. The advices that I give you to build contentment, to groom contentment, to develop contentment in your life are pastoral advices given from this book. And the first one I believe that's screaming out of the passage is to make sure that you receive the word of God. So it's obvious that the word of God was getting in. It wasn't just bouncing off ears or getting as far as the ear. It was getting into the heart. So I wasn't the first one to make this connection, but scholars have made the connection with Jesus' teaching of this in the New Testament when he spoke about the four soils, remember? So I want to remind you of that real quick now because that text really does teach us about the heart and its ability to reject the word or to receive the word. It's the perfect place to go. So let's take a look at it first. I find in that passage in the New Testament, that that account, that parable in the New Testament, three requirements of a good harvest. The first requirement is the simple sowing of the seed. And what what Jesus was saying is if there's no sowing of the seeds of the word, if you're not going to hear with your ears, there's no possible harvest. It's logical. So let's start there in the importance or with the importance of sharing the scriptures, sharing the word, discipling, quiet time, study, meditation, these things we've spoken about in the series already. It's interesting to me how the habit of the scriptures and the importance of the scriptures in the Christian's life is woven together biblically with contentment, by the way. And so, no seed, no harvest. The second requirement for a good harvest is an understanding of the word. An understanding of the word. So, What Jesus was saying is it's not enough to just hear with your ears. You've got to understand the word. And we are left with a choice to make. We are invited after hearing the word to make a decision. And the invitations are twofold. To dig into the scriptures, to mine the scriptures for their meaning or to reject them. That's the choice that's before us. And the invitation is yours. The invitation is mine. Am I going to mine the scriptures for their meaning or am I going to just turn a deaf ear to the truth of God's word. That's all involved in the understanding of the word. And then there's a third requirement as well, the receiving of the word. And those texts go to great length to describe that. It's not hearing with your ears. It's hearing with your heart. And so the four hearts are described. The first heart is the busy heart. It's trodden, like the pathway behind our church. We have a trail that goes behind our church here. At first, it was very mushy and and loose and I actually, to be honest with you, when we were developing it, I thought, there's no way you're going to ride a bicycle on this. It's just like loose sand. Today, it's rock hard, compacted, and people ride their bicycles and they push their prams and they jog along that path. It is well beaten and busy. And the description of that is that's how some people's hearts are. So hard and compressed, compacted, that the word just kind of bounces off. It doesn't penetrate. That's the picture that's given, and this kind of person is uninterested in the truth. And according to the scriptures, that particular kind of heart, hostile toward God, remains hostile and is not saved, cannot be rescued. The second kind of heart is a shallow, rocky heart, which according to the Bible hears the word, because all of these hearts hear the word. The word is proclaimed, but receiving the word and hearing the word are two different things, Jesus is saying. So the second description is of a heart that quickly grabs the gospel, joy and enthusiasm in the beginning, because of course, I've just heard that I'm a sinner, and I need to be saved, and I need heaven, I need forgiveness, I need life, rather than death and punishment because of my sin. And so quickly, people will grab Jesus and say, yeah, come and join all the other things that saved me. I've got my money and my health and my other friends and whatever else, and then I've got Jesus as well. So I've basically got the ba- the, all the bases covered. But there's no roots according to this teaching of the Lord. And without roots, when tribulation comes and hardship and persecution and life really squeezes, then that tree is blown over. This shallow, rocky kind of uh, picture of, of soil 
is really a picture of some people's hearts today when it comes to the scriptures. And some people in the church, they will claim to be Christian, claim to have Christ, but when really squeezed by pressures of life, faith doesn't emerge. And this particular heart of a person is not saved in the end. The third is the thorny heart, remember? So the thorny heart would be that person that hears the word but is preoccupied. So the three things that Jesus lists out are worries of life, and these things might be things that you face as well. Worries in life, because there's so many. Life is just so busy with trying to get. I was talking to, to Amber and some friends over the weekend about how there's so many rules. I mean, there's so much fine print in life. I mean, to wade through it all is almost impossible if we're really going to be honest about it. And so, preoccupied with the worries of life is one issue. Jesus listed out the riches of life, which is like a false sense of security. So, okay, Christ, I'm glad that you're on board. When the time comes, I got you in the bank, right? But what I really need right now is for that bottom line to be slightly more inflated because then I will be safe. Then I'll have what somebody called recently a nest egg or, or comfort. I've got some kind of comfort to rely on. And people invest entire lives in this. They are preoccupied with creating their own sense of security. And the third that Jesus mentions is lust. And he's speaking there of anything that takes the place of the Bible. So whatever your heart longs for more than meeting Jesus here is something under this category, the preoccupying of your affections. So these particular individuals hear the word, and if tested, they would know the word. But in the end, this thorny heart also is not saved. It's quite, it's quite a sobering thought to think about. I'll touch more on two and three just in one more statement later. But the last of the four types of soil describing the human heart is described as the good soil, the true heart. And this particular individual hears the word, and this is how the literal Greek puts it. The word is welcomed. And I know elsewhere in the New Testament this idea is given where the word feels at home in this individual's heart. Verse 20 of that passage speaks about how the word sticks and it saves. And the way you can test it, because the test is given as well, is by the fruit it produces. So in the end, through all the trials and the pressures and the hardships, the ups and the massive downs of life, what emerges in the end of this particular person's life is a whole ton of fruitfulness. And you might say, well, what does the fruit look like? How do I test it quickly? Well, the fruitfulness of the scriptures speaks about obedience. It speaks about a person being committed, loyal, and obedient to God no matter what the pressure. Have you met a person like that? Because I have. They are a delight to meet. A delight to know. The kind of people you just want to like be with. Children of God that are committed to the Lord in terms of their obedience and their life is just lush fruitfulness. And whatever they touch just becomes fruitfulness for the, for the Lord. I am not saying without hardship. Not at all. In the hardship, the fruit just glows from their life. And the end of this particular life is that this person is saved for eternity. They are saved. So what's something that's really gripped my heart is the fact that number two and number three are the problem area. Number one, people are disinterested, rejecting, don't have any, any time. The Word of God does not feature or matter to that particular man or woman. That, that you can understand that one, that, that particular heart. And you probably know people like that. But two and three, this is where the problem area comes in for me. You've got a person here who claims to be a follower of Christ, and according to what's been described, actually are doing some of the right things. So we probably wouldn't be able to tell from the outside if this person was a follower of Jesus or not. But in the end, they don't show any fruitfulness through the storms of life at all, and according to Scripture, will not find salvation. No fruitfulness in the end shown, and no salvation found. 
So listen to this quote for me from Warren Wiersbe. Um, he speaks about true Christianity. And he, he helps in this quote. It's, it's quite in-depth, so listen carefully. But he ties, I believe, the Word and the Scriptures and their role to contentment again. Scripture seems to do this. So I'm paying attention to that in this mini-series. I'm noticing how every week there's invitation to be back in the Scriptures, back in the Scriptures, back in the Scriptures, and today is no different. This is what Warren Wesby says. <clears throat> the secret of Christian joy, I call the sermon glad, this is the entire topic of this message. The secret of Christian joy is to believe what God says in His Word. And we all say amen. And Warren Wiersbe goes on to say, and act upon it, the fruit. So you can believe it, like as in the demons believe all sorts of things about the Bible, all sorts of truthful things about Christ. But they also act, these particular men and women, they act upon the word of God and the fruitfulness of obedience and commitment and loyalty to Christ is seen in their life even to death when persecution comes as martyrs. Faith, he goes on to say, that isn't based on the word of God is not faith at all. It is presumption or superstition, and we know all about that in South Africa. Joy that isn't result of a faith is not joy at all. It is only a good feeling. Some of the soil types, like two and three, the shallow little rocky soil and the thorny soil with all the weeds in it as well, are like this. It's a good feeling that disappears. It fades. So I quickly run to Jesus on that day, but then when the pressure comes, fades. We've seen this. Church family, we've seen this. We've seen it in the testimony of people. Faith based on the word will produce joy that will weather all the storms of life, is what he says. And I love that quote because it summarizes those themes of the word and the obedience, genuine faith, and particularly joy. I think I'm going to take time to read it again. Listen to this quickly just as I read it all together. The secret of Christian joy is to believe what God says in his word and act upon it. Faith that isn't based on the word is not faith at all. It is presumption and superstition. Joy that isn't the result of faith is not joy at all. It's only a good feeling that will soon disappear. Faith based on the word will produce joy and will weather all the storms of life. Baptists generally have been, or let me say traditionally rather, Baptists traditionally have been quite proud about the fact that we are people of the book. I know some other denominations have claimed that little phrase for themselves as well. But Baptists, I can say with certainty, have through the years claimed the title, we are people of the book. And I'm personally quite proud of that as well. I'm quite committed as a Baptist for that particular reason. Because of what Scripture says, like 2 Timothy chapter 3.16. We know John 3.16 by heart. This would be another one, another 3.16 to memorize. 2 Timothy 3.16 says that Scripture is profitable for teaching and for reproof and for correction and training in righteousness so that the man of God or the woman of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So the scriptures are profitable. They're profitable. That's why Charles Spurgeon, probably one of the most, maybe the most famous Baptist preacher, Charles Spurgeon said, the deeper you dig into scripture, the more you find it is a great abyss of truth. And anyone taking the time committed to the book knows exactly what I'm talking about. You start to scratch the surface and then there's like gold to be found. And the longer you live, you just, you, you, you discover the magnitude of the wealth that has to be discovered in Scripture. And that's why Charles Spurgeon goes on to say, the Scriptures teem with marvels. The Bible is a wonderland. It not only relates miracles, which are like, you know, mind-blowing for us, but itself is a world of wonders. The Bible is the Word of God. Let me just say that statement one more time. The Bible is the Word of God. So what are you saying, preacher? 
I'm saying that if you pick up the Bible and you mine it for those treasures, you will discover God speaking. That's what I want to lay before you as a particular advice to grow contentment in your life. Because I know Christians that can, you know, they can vaguely get through the Bible and they can point in the right direction. Like I know where the Old Testament is and I know where the New is. I know where Genesis is versus Revelation. But to mine and know the Scriptures and in so doing know God is a different story altogether. My advice to receive. I chose that word so carefully based on the four soils. To receive the word of God. And in so doing, grow contentment in your life. Number two. If that's the first advice I have, the second one is to remember God's work. So to remember the work of God. Receive the word of God. And secondly, remember the work of God. So let's get back to Nehemiah 8. The people hear and they receive because we're convinced that they are, they are hearing with clarity and with understanding. They receive the word of God five to six hours a day. So there's license here for me to increase my sermon time a whole span. I mean, I can fivefold, okay? Five or six hours a day, they were attentive in verse three and the people respond to the word. Now what's interesting is their initial response is grief. And I've discovered in my Christian life that my initial response is grief as well. When I read the scriptures and I hear of God's standard and I'm aware of God's holiness, I'm immediately overcome with how far I fall short of the standard of God. And I'm sure that if you are a Bible student, a Bible scholar, reader, meditator, you will agree with the same thing because Romans describes what happens. The Bible, God's word, convicts initially. That's what it does. It convicts initially. It highlights where we don't make it. So Romans 3.20 says, For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. And I'm relieved by that. Because if it was by works of the law, none of us would be able to say, I kept the law, God. Let me in. Since, and this is how the law works, through the law comes knowledge of sin. So if you're going to be sitting under the sermon of Ezra, you're going to be pierced to your heart. Because over and over again, you're going to see God's holy standard and say, look, I didn't make it. I'm not good enough. But praise the Lord, there's a second work of the word. And the second work of the, of the word is to, con, to comfort. Conviction and comfort go hand in hand. But before I go on to the comfort, listen to this quote by Matthew Henry. This is what the law does. The law works, and this is very graphic language, the law works death. It speaks terror. The standard of God represented in the scriptures shows men their sin and their misery and their danger because of their own sin. Living in danger on a trajectory, I would add to Matthew Henry, a trajectory to hell. The word of God thunders a curse against everyone that continues not in every part of his duty. So if you're failing on one part of the duty, one part of the law, one part of the standard, one part of the requirement, which is perfection, by the way, if you're failing in any possible way, man, the law of God screams a thunderous curse against you. And I don't know if everyone has heard that curse, but it's there. God's law can't save, it can't justify, according to Romans 3, But it can convince us of two things. The word of God will convince you that you have a big need of forgiveness. And you have a second need of life. You know that the Bible says that we are dead in our transgressions and our sin? It's not that we need reviving. We need resurrection. And the word of God explains that clearly that you have a big need. And anyone understanding the scriptures has come to that place many times. God. I need a savior. God, I can't do this on my own. I fall way short of your expectation of me. I need Jesus. And that's exactly what the law is designed to do. And secondly, the law comforts. And this is the beautiful thing. While the law would wound, the law will heal. The only healing for the wound is the law itself, is the word of God. 
In the context of Nehemiah 8, you might ask, well, where is that comfort found? It's very interesting. The comfort is found in the form of a reminder. Hence the, the language I used in my second point here, to remember God's work. Remember. So Nehemiah and, and Ezra are part of this like revival um, crusade in a way. It's a massive gathering meeting. And this is the context of the calendar. I, I found this extraordinary. I read it first straight through it. And then I went back and said, why is there so much reference to the month and the day and the festivals and all that kind of thing? So I lined it all up. What's going on here? And I realized there's one massive reminder for the people. And it must come as a reminder to you too this morning. That this was the seventh month of the year, the Jewish calendar year, a very special, significant spiritual month. Why? Because on the first day, which was this particular day of hearing the sermon, the Feast of Trumpets was celebrated. And as I understand, I have limited knowledge of it, but what I've understood so far is that the trumpets were blown and the trumpets would kick into gear this day's festivity. What was the day? It was set aside to be a day of rest. That's what we're striving for in the sermon, contentment, rest. And it was set aside as a day of remembrance. And the two were connected. How are we going to rest? Well, we're going to re rest by remembering what God has done, His works. So the people would take time specifically to consider God's provision for, for His people, His protection for His people through Good days and bad days, God had remained faithful, and the result of the whole focus of that day was God's goodness. So, so church family, take that to the bank. You want to grow contentment in your life? Remember God's works and particularly focus on God's goodness. Amen? God has been good to us, very good to us. Second thing is the 10th day of the month, that same month, 10 days later, the Day of Atonement was celebrated, and I, I wish I had a sermon series on this alone. Maybe I will one day preach through all the significance of the Day of Atonement, but basically, this in a nutshell, this was a day set aside for atonement to be made. Sacrifices of animals were made on that day, and the result of that was that there would be substitution, the animals would die, and the blood would be spilt, and the people would be forgiven. And we are immediately just overawed by how much symbolism there is there for Jesus. And we realize that Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice made for us. His blood was spilt and the people, you and I, forgiven. Atonement made. And the whole day of atonement points to Christ. But it was that day to remember God dealing, making provision to deal with our sin so that sinners can be forgiven. No day of atonement, no forgiveness. It's incredible. So the whole focus of that particular day was God's grace. And then, of course, there's a third little part, and that is 15 through 21. So the 15th to the 21st of the month, there was the Day of Tabernacles celebrated, otherwise known as the Day of Booths. And this is literally what took place. The people would go and build themselves shelters. It's like a big, you know, scouts day. <laughs> Got that little project, build a shelter. So they had to build little shelters that would exist, would survive or help them to survive for seven days. So families would get together and they would build these little shelters and they would live in those shelters and it would be a reminder, a reminder. For 40 years, we as a people existed in the wilderness and God looked after us in the wilderness. And there were some specific perspectives to consider during the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles. The people during that seven days would look back at 40 years in the wilderness and realize that we are living under the shelter of God in these little shelters now and God's provision is still with us as it was in the wilderness. Looking back was the first perspective. The second perspective was to look around. Hey, for those seven days, families would now focus. Guys, for a minute, take your gaze off your circumstance. Take your gaze off disease. Take your gaze off the oppression and the exile. And the fact that we have nothing in the bank and we're trying to build the walls. Take your gaze off all that stuff. The enemies are coming. Take your gaze off that and focus on God's glory. The fact that around us are harvest blessings. That God is good currently. Look around. Look up and just see there's a shelter over our, our head. And last Sunday we described what our basic human needs were. Shelter. Covering, remember, shelter and clothing and food. And so looking around was an opportunity for the people to say, look, we got those things. The, the bases are covered. God, God's come through for us again. The harvest are ready. 
And then there was one other perspective, and that was looking ahead. If God has been good through the wilderness and he's currently good, what does that mean, children of faith? It means that God's going to be good in the future. The promises looking ahead were a glorious kingdom that God had promised. Take it to the bank. It's a done deal. It's secure. It's steadfast. It doesn't matter what happens right now. The outcome for us is nothing but God's glory. And so, backing up, I just considered, wow, the remembering of the whole calendar was a remembering of God's goodness, God's grace, and God's glory. Something that I believe would do us good today, to just pause, maybe build a shelter in your back. I'm just kidding. Don't do that. Just Pause for a minute and consider God's goodness in the past. How he has provided Jesus Christ as our ultimate atonement to secure our justification before a holy God. No one can argue with the fact that that God who provided that sacrifice is good. And the result of that justification is that at the moment I am being groomed for glory. And so at the moment I'm being made to be like Christ. Some of the persecution, some of the suffering, some of the hardship, some of the stormy weather I'm facing in life, COVID, and I can list that, all that stuff again because I, I guess that's what preachers do today. It is a big, big struggle of our world. That kind of thing that we face is for our good, Christian. I don't know if you've prayed like you prayed before COVID, but my prayer life has, has really increased in the last 18 months to two years. It's for our good, God is good currently sanctifying and making us more like Christ. And then future, of course, the glorious kingdom is in our future. And if you are justified, you can base it on the fact that you are being sanctified. The promises are true. It doesn't matter what happens today. It does not matter. Anything that this world has to offer by way of affliction, hardship, and persecution does matter nothing compared to the glorious kingdom that is in our future looking ahead. So my point, my advice, through the lens of Nehemiah 8, is to, first of all, receive God's word, and secondly, remember the work of God and allow that work of God in his word to initially convict, but then draw and bathe you in comfort. As scholars have said, to hurt and then to heal, to wound and then to bring the healing. Remember God's work. Then one, one last advice I have for you to grow and groom contentment would be, based on this text, to rejoice in the wonder of God. One more time. Receive the word of God. To then remember the work of God. And then thirdly, rejoice in the wonder of God. I want to ask you a question. Do you know that God is happy? Now just think about it. Because I think initially, your first image of God that comes to mind is not one of God being happy. God is judge, so he's just. God is fair and he's father. But do you know that the Bible goes to lengths to describe God as being happy? Do you believe, I want to ask you this question, if you know that, I want to ask you this. Has it been internalized in such a way that you trust that? That you believe with your whole being, your whole heart, do you believe that God is happy? I, I took some time just to meditate, as I normally do each week, and think about this concept, and I came up with a title for God. A trinity of contentment and joy is our God. Write it down. Because it's true. A trinity of contentment and joy is our God. Always, in essence, and fully joyful and happy. Nehemiah 8.10 is the verse that encapsulates this idea. And it's an invitation to us to tap into God's unlimited joy supply. So for the last three weeks, we've given you bookmarks, right? I'm on number three here in my Bible. I'll show you them. There's edition one and edition two. Sorry, edition one, edition two. And now today, edition three. 
and we'll have one more for you next week. And this is what the bookmark reads. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. When you go to the Christian bookstore and you look at the little you know, placard that you have in your fridge and the card that you get you know, for your birthday that's Christian, you will find the second half of the verse. You'll find, for the joy of the Lord is your strength everywhere. But tying it into the context is the grief. So coming out of point two in this message to point three, this is perfect. People are weeping, they are grieving, they are torn in their heart, they're convicted of the fact that they've fallen short of the standard that God requires, and this is what washes over their soul. Don't be grieved. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. So what does it mean? What does it mean? Well, let me ask you one question further, and that is, do you know that God, as a result of being happy, fully, in essence, and always, finds joy in you? Do you know that? Do you believe that? Because for a long period of my early Christian life, I didn't believe that. I I was overcome by the conviction. How could God be happy with me? Look what I've done, and look how I've fallen short. Look who I am. There's no possible way God can be happy with me. I want to ask you the question again. Do you believe today that God finds joy in you? And lots of preachers will end the message there, and they'll say, because that's the reality, and they'll jump up and down about this being a reality. And what happens is people respond to it wrongly, and I want to make sure I correct that mistake this morning. Most would get a big head and say, you know what? God is happy with me. You know why? Because I'm joy worthy. I'm special. I've got what it takes to impress God. You're right. God can do nothing other than to express his joy in me because I'm really a delight to him. That's exactly the opposite of what this verse is teaching. Be careful. The Bible is not suggesting that God can't help rejoicing over us because we're so amazing. No, the Bible is saying that we experience joy from God because that's what He does. He's a joy giver because He's joy. God is happy, and so He's in the business of taking delight in. It's not in the merits of who we are, but because of who He is. That we are justified and we are adopted, and so God takes delight in His justified and adopted children because He is a joyful God. He is a happy God. And Zephaniah 3.17 of all places teaches us this. Zephaniah 3.17. The Lord your God is in your midst. He's with you. A mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. And here's the connection to contentment. He will quiet you by his love. Quiet you. And some of you today listening online, you need to be quieted. My children are an example of this. Sometimes life gets in such a tiz, they need to be quiet. Now, hold on. Calm down. And this is why. So God is the God that comes as a good father and he quiets us with his love. Let me love on you a little bit. Let me hold you. Let me just get you to get perspective on what's going on here. He will exalt over you with loud singing. It's, it's, it's grand, loud rejoicing over his children. I'm thinking it's fantastic. And it's all connected to contentment. Here's the point. Any joy we ever receive, think about it. What gave you joy? I'm talking about in the midst of your suffering, in the midst of your hardship. What is the light in the midst of the darkness? That's what we sing about all the time. Any joy we ever receive originates from the joy that God has. That's where it came from. The joy of the Lord, God's happiness, is our strength, this verse teaches. Nehemiah 8, people, like I said, weeping for their own weakness. Some of you are weeping. Because maybe this pressure in life over COVID and things like that has caused you to now mine into God's word. And so you've cracked open a dusty Bible and said, Lord, I I need to find you. I need truth. Um, I'm feeling hungry and thirsty here. So I'm going to come and drink and and find satisfaction in the word. And so cracking over the Bible, suddenly you overcome with the, the reality that I fall short of God's standard. 
And so your failures are up in your face. Your weaknesses are up in your face. Your sin is right in your face and it convicts and there's hurt. I personally don't know of a hurt more severe that I've experienced in my life than that particular hurt of conviction. And then, of course, man, the, the, the waves of God's mercy and His grace and His love and joy are shown to me in verses like this. That the joy of the Lord is my strength. The remedy to the hurt is the healing of the Word. And the healing of the Word is speaking of the joy of God's character. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Meaning this, Tom Reinke defines it so beautifully. He said, you will never be spiritually stronger than your God is happy. Let me say it again. You will never be spiritually stronger than your God is happy. In the midst of our failures, God is oozing joy and happiness toward us, his children, delighting over us, singing songs over his children. For, for me, that is strength. That's encouraging. So partial advice today. If you're feeling discontented, and I probably real all of you, and I don't know of anybody here today that's feeling like 100% contented, so if you're feeling discontent at various levels, my advice is are oh, from Nehemiah 8, receive God's word here, not in your head. We don't need another theologian necessarily. Well, we don't need a theologian that hasn't got the word in his heart. Let's put it that way. Secondly, remember God's work, his goodness, his grace, and his glory, past, present, future, and then rejoice in God's wonder that God Almighty is happy. People are standing there, needing some encouragement. Ezra's preached his message. I've preached mine. What happened next? Well, Nehemiah stood up and took some leadership. And the result of that leadership was calming. And I want to do exactly the same. I'd like to read a passage for you. I'd like you maybe to close your eyes or you can turn there if you'd like to follow. It's Psalm 103. It ties in with what I've shared. Psalm 103. And I'm just going to read it from the pulpit that I've been given. And I'd love for it to wash over you this morning. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Remember. Remember. This is who he is. He forgives all your iniquity. He heals all your diseases. He redeems your life from the pit. He crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. He satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed, even those in Afghanistan. He made known his ways to Moses, that's law, his acts to all the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, please church here, Grieved over sin, he will not always blame. That's what that word means. He will not always blame, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins deserving. Praise God. Or repay us according to our iniquities, because Jesus paid the payment. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who, who fear him. That's the good heart. That's the heart that receives the word. That's the heart that responds in salvation and faith. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him, his children. Let's pray. Father, we delight to think about your joy this morning. We delight to think of your responses toward us because of what Christ has done on the cross. We can now be considered your adopted children, Lord, and 
Your songs are sung over us, Lord, exalting over us. Any joy that we experience in this world comes from that particular source, O oh God, and we are, we are delighted to receive it. It doesn't matter about our circumstance, whether it be persecution or hardship or struggle, famine, disease, financial, relational, psychological. Father, we delight in the fact that the source of our joy is you, stable, steadfast. We take these advices from your word, Lord, and pray for help in receiving your word and help to remember your work so that the response might be to rejoice in the wonder of who you are. Please, con please make your church, cause your church to be contented, I pray, Lord. May, may calm rest on those that listen this morning as we take a breath in the fact that you are our happy God, our happy Father. We pray all this in the name of our Savior, Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming today. Please grab your little card as you...